This is the day that the Lord has made. It is good to see everyone today on this, uh, this first Sunday of Lent. Uh, we had, and it, it was just wonderful, we had uh, maybe 50, 60 people, somewhere in that range, for Ash Wednesday on uh, Wednesday night. And uh, that really kicked off Lent. Lent is a season of 40 days plus Sundays of preparation for Easter. It's a time when we reflect on um, especially when we reflect on those things that tend to get in the way of us loving God, of us loving our neighbor, of us loving ourselves. And uh, so we, as as the liturgy uh, says, we invite you to a holy Lent. Um, And for the next few Sundays, um, that's the season that we'll be in. Also on Wednesdays, uh, starting this Wednesday, we have our annually held Lenten lunches. So every Wednesday at 12 o'clock, you can come and eat lunch. Uh, it's put on by the United Women of Faith, and we have a visiting preacher for four of those five Sundays, and I do the other one. So um, this first Sunday is Reverend Bill Bennett, who is the rector at St. Mark's Episcopal Church. I'm sorry? A Wednesday. What did I say? No, not this first Sunday. (laughs) Rewind it back. Instant replay. This first Wednesday, uh, we have Reverend Bill Bennett, uh, who's with us. You might notice that Sly's changed his hairstyle today. Um, Doug Mabe is our uh, lay reader today. Slice Penny, our intern from Duke, is at a youth conference at Lake June, Alaska in the mountains. Uh, And he has maybe 100, 150 kids. I didn't hear an exact count, but a lot of youth in his care from a Western North Carolina uh, conference event. So please pray for Slice and uh, for the youth that are in his care. Um, We have, let's see, what else we want to say? Uh, Backpack Pals, we heard last Sunday, and it's important to share with those who are watching as well as here. Uh, That is the weekend food program for public school kids who are food insecure. Uh, They're now up over 400 kids every week, a huge increase. Uh, And so that's a lot of hungry families in our community. I know the Christian Help Center, they are also up just with families over 20%. Uh, in recent months. So there's a lot of hungry families in our community and there's information in your bulletin about how to support that. Um, You will also note that it is time to order Easter lilies. There's information about that in your bulletin. And we continue to ask through March 1st for uh, everyone that's a part of the church to fill out a new contact information sheet. There's a a uh, link there, which is a little bit confusing. We have uh, to to print. That link came in your email if you're already connected. Uh, We also have some paper copies of that uh, outside in the narthex. And uh, you could contact Jonna Fitzgerald. Jonna, there's some visitors here that might not know you. She's waving if you would like to get connected with us and a phone number there for her uh, as well. Um, I want to ask now... Yes, I'd like to ask Tommy Humphreys to give an important announcement. Good morning. Good morning. I want to get y'all excited today. All right. April 19th, put on your calendars now. That will be fun day this year. Fun day's coming back. we got plans going on. Everything's going. A lot of excitement. We're going to have a barbecue dinner, and Bill Savison is coming back to help cook. We're very excited about that. We're going to have a 50-50 raffle, and all the proceeds from the 50-50 raffle are going to local missions. So we want you to get involved with that. If you look also in the white part here, you'll see that we're going to have a silent auction. Uh, and as a contact information, we're going to have a number of exciting uh, uh, things to bid on. I think we already got three vacation homes that you can bid on. So be there. This is April 19th. A lot of fun time. We look forward to all of you being there and put it down. We'll be selling tickets in the next week or two. So y'all be ready. Thank you. Tommy, 
Tommy, what is the, for, we've got a bunch of people here who have never been to a fun day, uh, like, like we do a fun day. What's the purpose behind yeah. it? Why do we have it? Fun day, we've had this, we started, the very first one was for the debt that we had when we, we redid the building, when we put the elevator in and all that. And that was when we, we started that. We paid that off. We rested for a while. COVID hit, so it stopped. Well, during COVID, we had done some renovate. Well, we had to replace some air conditioning units. We did the parsonage, and we've got a loan there we haven't paid off yet. Now we're working on that. Our long-range plan is we're going to pay that off very fast. I mean, we're going to do that quick. And from now on, all the fund day money that we make will be going toward missions. So help us get this done fast, and then from that point forward, we can have tons of money that we can help locally, and with any other events, that, any other disasters or anything else we need to help. So get involved. Let's get happy. Thank you. Thank you. And if you think of another day, everybody gives me a hard time. Like, Why do you call it Fun Day? We might have a box at Fun Day and put your suggestion of a new name <laughs> if you want a new name. And we'll look at it. And if it comes up, we might change it from Fun Day. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Like Super Bowl. <laughs> I, no, that's taken. Um, we continue with our worship this morning. Good morning. Please join me in our call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let us return to the Lord. Let us pray. 
God of glory and mercy, before his death in shame, your son sent, went to the mountaintop and you revealed his life and glory. Where prophets witnessed to him, you proclaimed him your son, but he returned to die among us. Help us face evil with courage, knowing that all things, even death, are subject to your transforming power. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand in body or heart as you're able as we sing our opening hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus, number 189 in your hymnal. standing and let us join together in professing our faith using the words from page 881 in your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
share the peace of Christ with one another. Peace of Christ. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let us pray together this prayer for illumination, which you can find printed in your bulletin. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as your scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is going to be a little bit different, and there's a a typographical error in your bulletin. Um, we will read our scripture responsibly today. It's Psalm 25, and you will find it printed on page 757 in your hymnal, not on, not on 755. The men will read the plain text, and the women will read the bold text. In. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Let none that wait for you be put to shame. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Lead me in your truth and teach me. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, the Lord instructs sinners in the way and leads the humble in what is right and teaches them their way.
Thank you, God, for cracking something open in my heart through your words and music uh, again. Uh, maybe you were blessed as well. I would invite the kids to come down now for a children's message. Autumn, you see the mic. Is... <clears throat> come on down, and then we're going to dismiss them after the children's sermon to children's church. And when we do that, we're going to sing, We Are Marching in the Light of God as a congregation. The words for that are printed in your bulletin. ago we listened to Psalm 25 and did you know that that's actually a special song in the Bible where David asked God for help and guidance so just like David sometimes we need help oh, you, want me to turn it on? you don't think I'm loud enough you don't think I'm loud enough they need it too. Oh, come on. I cut it on I did my part but I don't know why so tell me if you are in a really dark room What's one thing you could use to try to get out? Um, your hands. Your hands? Uh-huh. What else? What do you think, Madison? Flashlight. A flashlight. And so God is kind of like a flashlight. You know? Did you know that? You didn't? So can you see a flashlight in a room that has light in it already? Mm, but you can still see it, right? Right. 
So even in the light and the dark rooms, God is there. So God's like a flashlight because he shows us the way in the dark times in our life and even in the good times. He fills our life with light, right? What's the way he can fill our life with light? Making us happy, right? So he wants us to ask for help when we're having trouble finding the light in our life, right? He promises to guide us like a good friend, just like he would want us to be a good friend and be the light for somebody else, right? How can we be the light for somebody else? That's right. If somebody's lost trying to find their class, you help them find it. That's right, because the school's big, right? So we can talk to him when we're scared or if something is going wrong and we're having a bad day or we got in trouble. Mm -hmm. We can talk to him, and he'll show us a path of love and kindness with his flashlight, right? So can anybody tell me a time that you felt like God was a flashlight for you? where he helped you when you were in trouble or when you were upset. Nobody? You got one? One time I didn't know what to do and I just couldn't figure it out and I was kind of nervous and I asked God for help and he sent, God sent some friends and they helped me figure out what to do. And that was like God being a flashlight. Yep, that's right. So every day we need to trust that God is going to lead us by his flashlight as we need to also be a light for others. Okay? Can y'all pray with me? What do we do when we pray? One, two, three. Good job. Dear God, thank you for always guiding us and showing us the way. Help us to trust you and follow your path and always look to you to be the flashlight in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Some of you love that song. This one's for you. That, that song, Marching in the Light of God. I had a request for it, and so I, you know, we went back to singing it again. Somebody liked it so much. Can you believe it was only a week ago that that big uh, uh, football game was on, the Super Bowl? Came down, did anybody watch it or see the highlight? Came down in thrilling fashion and overtime to one last play. And I think I remember the winning team's receiver giving the credit to God for the win, which is fine and I'm sure became the subject of some social media memes for how we should always remember to give thanks to God. That's good. Uh, and that receiver said he had worked so hard and his team never stopped believing and therefore he thanked God for the win. So therefore, I'm sure since God was behind that win that God is eagerly awaiting the tithes and the NFL star size commission checks that those players are surely owe to God for playing such an important role in helping them win that big game. By the way, uh, Mr. Receiver, if you're watching, I know that we're streaming this, uh, Long Memorial is welcoming new members, and we would appreciate your tithes and uh, your offerings as well. This is a place that is filled with welcoming people. Everyone turn around and wave at Mr. Receiver. See? Yeah. Come on down. We'd love to have you uh, and to figure out what God will have us do together. Now, as for the other team, the team that didn't win, evidently the opposite must be true, that God forgot about their hard work or really never paid attention to it. 
at least on the field, they for a while were the sport's enemy and their fervent prayers, which no doubt were being lifted up, didn't carry the same weight according to the line of thinking of the game-winning receiver. What's more, this sermon is about remembering and forgetting In last week's game, there are certain plays and decisions that get remembered as being turning points, and there are certain plays and decisions that get forgotten. I am, I I like watching basketball. I grew up in the Michael Jordan era, uh, and he was a big deal when I was uh, playing and like the greatest and whatever. Debate that all day long if you want, but uh, he was no doubt one of the most iconic athletes of all time, but he said famously, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost 300 games almost. I've been trusted to gain, to take the game winning shot in 26 games and I missed those. He was the not game winner in 26 different games. He said in this quote at whatever point in time that was. Of course, winning, losing, remembering, forget that's just sports that I'm talking about. Contests where the rules are the same for both teams. And the teams show up, they play the game, then they go home and take a nap or eat dinner uh, or whatever. Best friends can be on rival teams, one beating the other or vice versa. It's been hard here in Roxboro in, what do you call it, like Spike Town, I think is one of the nicknames for Roxboro. Um, is that what they call it? Volley town. I'm sorry. So bad. I'm from Detroit. We call that hockey town up there. So I'm still not from around here. Volley town. I've had to go to games where P, uh, person high school is playing Roxburgh community school in volleyball. And I've got people from our youth group on both sides where I get all kinds of high fives when I cheer sometimes. But when I keep cheering for the enemy team, then I'm getting mean looks from the parents and the players. Do you remember the Bugs Bunny cartoon with the sheepdog and the wolf? Every morning, the sheepdog and the, the sheepdog's job was to protect the sheep from the wolf. And the wolf's job, of course, was to steal the sheep from the sheepdog. But every morning, they'd go in just like business people. And they'd say, good morning, Sam. Good morning, Ralph. And they'd check in like friends. And then they'd go be enemies for the day which is kind of like sports. And then at the end of the day, after they'd beat each other up all day, they would check out and they'd be like, how you doing, Sam? Have a good night. How you doing, Ralph? Have a good night. Anyway, all of that is not at all what the psalmist is talking about today, but it's a fun intro. Although winning and losing and striving themes in the Bible, when they do come up, often serve as motivational sports for quotes. I'll bet lots of athletes have, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me up on a poster or something in their room. That's good and fine. Uh, there's not a lot of sports references in scripture because the Bible is mostly about things of the spirit and sports kind of in the whole scheme of things, pale in comparison to the the things of the spirit of souls and lives and death. So let's move to the words and life events that have more gravity. This psalm that we read responsively, and I love reading things responsively, men and women like that, so that we get to hear one another's voices, uh, all of which are important. This psalm is one that the Bible says was written by David. Now, King David in the Bible, you might remember, is the same David as David and Goliath. And that's not just a kid's story of Sunday school times. I mean, that was a young person, probably, who was too little to wear the armor, but who went out to face the terrible sort of uh, the biggest weapon of the enemy, which was the giant Goliath, whose spear was so heavy and his armor was huge and he was just huge. And he had to, uh, I'm sure that soldier Goliath, he intimidated and paralyzed the entire rest of the army. And David, if you remember, first found favor with King Saul, but then after a few victories and successes, became the focus of Saul's jealous rage. And Saul didn't just root for the other team like we do in our sports competitions. Saul wanted him dead. That's terrifying. David had to flee and hide out in the wilderness while Saul and his army pursued him. So in this psalm, David talks about his enemies. 
But he also talks about treachery. Treachery being when someone who you think is on your team isn't really on your team anymore. And David begs God not to let those who mean to harm him have their way. But David also focuses in the psalm admitting on, on himself, admitting that he hasn't always gotten it right himself. He has made mistakes and he asks God not to remember. He asks God to forget his own mistakes. In our culture, we tend to idolize or demonize each other or even ourselves. You're either all good or you're all bad. That so-and-so, she's a good woman. She's a hero. Or that guy, he's a crook. He's no good. He belongs in jail. All, All good, all bad. And we ask ourselves, why is it that those who act in underhanded ways often live lives of ease and opulence? Why is it? that sometimes it seems that those who are deceiving and defrauding others have life made is what it looks like. We wonder that, but what is true now was also true some 2,700 years ago in David's day. David is doing right, at least he says he is in the psalm. He is staying faithful to God's ways. He appeals to God's mercy and faithful love. He admits he's not always gotten it right, and he asks God to forget the times he's done wrong. He says, remember me, O God, for the sake of your goodness, O God. And so in confessing those things that he had had transgressions and former sins of his youth, he admits that we don't always get it right. Now, some of us have this notion that God is up there with some sort of cosmic ray gun, just watching with a target right on our chest or two targets like crosses or on Ash Wednesday, uh, the targets on our forehead, just waiting for us to mess up. And God, when we mess up, we kind of think that God's like, you know, and kind of punish us. And by the way, if you came to Ash Wednesday service, this is just an aside, slice drew some really big targets on people's foreheads. Bold. Slice, if you're watching this, people are wondering if you have any tips to get that off. I still see some of the shadow. Uh, Mine were kind of smudges. Like some of us had the, like almost unnoticeable. So, uh, and I even nudged him during the service. I was like, you know, the congregation is going to turn this into a competition. Uh, The bold crosses and kind of the hidden, anyway, that's, that's nothing. We love you, Slice. When I'm explaining God's grace and mercy, I like to use the analogy of a toddler or a small child in the care of a loving parent or grandparent, an uncle or an aunt. And let's say the grandma says, now, little toddler person, don't go in the cookie jar before dinner. And then grandma goes about her business and doing her work and getting ready or whatever. And sure enough, she catches that toddler breaking the rule with his hand in the cookie jar. Now, grandma does not stop loving that little child, right? There might be a little consequence like, well, you had your cookie before, so you don't get to have it after. But mm, dollars to donuts, that child is going to be curled up on grandma's lap that evening and get a kiss before they go to bed, right? The, The love doesn't stop, even though, even though we might be like, oh, I wish you wouldn't done that, you're going to spoil your dinner. I kind of think as an analogy, God's sort of the same way. Here's what's best for you, but then we being human can't resist reaching into the cookie jar. And God is like, oh, you're going to spoil your dinner. (laughs) I'm still going to love you. Let me kiss you goodnight. But don't do that anymore. That's what it's kind of like. And, And if you've ever confronted a child who's in trouble, and you've seen the tears come, and, and the, the I'm, so, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I think what they're saying behind the tears is, please, I'm begging you, don't stop loving me. I know I made a little mistake. Please reassure me that I'm still yours. That's kind of like what Lent is sort of like. We come to understand that we throughout the year, throughout the years, throughout our lives have got our hands caught in the cookie jar where it shouldn't be. And and we are saying to God, please don't stop loving us. And God says, and I want you to hear this if you don't hear anything else, there is nothing that you can do. There is nothing that any of our neighbors can do 
that would separate them from the unbelievable, infinite love of God for you. Now, God might not be happy with you right at the moment because, you know, this might have hurt some people. We don't want that to continue. But God still loves you. What's more, the psalmist looks to the future and professes our hope and desire because we want to walk closer with God. We want to grow and learn. We want to become wiser. We want to learn how to love each other and ourselves more deeply. We want to experience the good as God sees it and, and as God wills it and God understands it. The, psalm says, good and up, the psalmist says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, the Lord instructs us sinners in the way and leads us when we are humble in what is right. And God teaches us in the way. Back to the sports imagery for another point here. I've seen some clips recently where nearing the end of a grueling marathon race, the winning runner, who the finish line is like right at those back doors or right here at the first pews, but the, the legs give out. The person absolutely collapses. And the second place runner is like, sweet, I'm going to win now. And yet the second place runner actually stops and kneels down and recognizes the accomplishment and has mercy and grace upon that runner who has collapsed and decides to take their life of integrity as being more important than a single win in that race. And so they scoop down and they pick them up and they sort of half carry them across the finish line together. It's a beautiful thing. In civic life, I know there are judges and politicians who believe in the value and integrity in the system of law and government who know that they could do something that would unfairly affect them, that they could act in a way that would give them great benefit. And, and those judges or politicians that have integrity would step away and say, I recuse myself. I'm going to let the chips fall where they might so that I'm not influencing this. And what a great thing that is and we need as a society. But there are also those who say, you know what? I'm not going to step away from that. This is going to work out pretty good for me. I'm just a person. And if I judge this way, it's good for everybody. And I'm part of everybody. So they stay involved and engaged and they don't recuse themselves. And if they're doing that to get personal gain, that's the very definition of corruption. And I don't think God likes that very much. Treachery, corruption, we, we see it in our own uh, world, in our modern day, but they're not new qualities. In fact, the psalm writer David lusted after Bathsheba and had her husband killed to get him out of the way. And the Bible is full of stories of betrayal and corruption and expedience and, and deception and stealing and immorality and unethical behavior, and it always has a consequence, and it's never of God. So the psalmist pledges his aspirations. In you I trust, O God, don't let me be put to shame. Make me to know your ways. Teach me your paths, O God. Did you know that we as Methodists these days, really, I think as Christians in general, we've got it pretty easy. We have, in this sense, we have adopted an enlarged notion of personal privacy which gives our sinful selves a lot of room to hide. I, I listened to a, a famous Christian speaker who's, uh, whose name escapes me right now, but I remember this story. And she was famous and there was some people coming, like 60 Minutes or somebody was coming to interview her in her own living room. And she cleaned up the whole house and made it look all presentable because she's going to be on TV. But then when they got there and the TV lights were on, extra, extra bright, she was mortified as the, as the interview was about to start because of all the dust bunnies and cobwebs that she couldn't see under the ordinary lights. She's like, oh, they're all going to see the stuff that I thought was hidden underneath the couch, right? Our own souls are kind of like that. We have our Facebook cells, or our Snapchat or whatever. We have this, this projection, even if we're not on social media, we sort of come to church all dressed up and how are you? I'm fine, it's wonderful to see you. We put on smiles. But inside we know that there's some corners in us somewhere. There's some stuff that we're dealing with. But we don't have to talk about that. We can just keep it, keep it going. But back in the day, when Methodists were first forming, they would come together in class meetings who were led not by a pastor, but by a lay person. And one of the, they would ask questions of each other. 
They would ask questions about the spiritual lives. They would ask, how is it with your soul? Which is really a piercing question if you really think about it. Now, I've asked that question to people too. And then I see the little light bulb go on and people say, it is well with my soul. (laughs) And I know that's you, that's fine. And there's people in this room that have said that, that's fine. It's good. I'm glad that it's well with your soul. But they weren't searching for a hymn title in that answer. They really cared. They really wanted to know. And they would also ask in those class meetings, what sin have you been struggling with this last week? Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Like, if I were to ask that question and demand or sort of expect that everyone would have to answer that out loud before leaving this room, if you wanted to continue at Long Memorial, we would have a very empty church. I'd probably be at the front of the line. I'd be out of, I don't want to air out my dirty laundry in front of others. So we don't press you on that very much, right? We don't expect that. So in that sense, we, we Christians have it a lot easier than maybe we used to when that was emphasized all the time. But here's the thing recognizing that we don't always get it right and, and sharing that at least with God but maybe also with someone who is trusted, who create, who loves us, who's not going to put it out on the street in some sort of gossip column, who wants us to be the whole people that God has called us to be, that can actually help us quite a bit in our spiritual journey. And so it is that we, we've kind of found a bit of a compromise when we have communion. We pray a corporate prayer of confession in big generalities so that we can be covered. We have sinned against you, O oh God, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We've failed to be an obedient church. We've not followed your ways. We, we are in the same boat. We've messed up. That's what that prayer of confession is saying. And then do you remember what happens after that? We, someone, I, the pastor says, God forgives us. Remember what Jesus did. Grace abounds. You are welcome to come to this table. But there is spiritual growth that can occur when we have the courage and humility to specifically confess our sins before God. Again, in safe places with trustworthy, spiritually mature people, Christ-centered, humble people, there can be spiritual growth that happens. But that would be a big jump for us to do it in some sort of mandated way. But I want to pause and just let you at least answer that before God today. How is it with your soul? What sins have you been wrestling with this week? Did you know that God already knows about them and that God still loves you and that God wants you to experience the forgiveness that God can empower? That that also, if you're wrestling with those sins that God desires and can empower you to turn around so that you're not harming the other or yourself or sort of anger towards God anymore, God desires all of that. Now, I want to say you perhaps confessed it or wrestled with that question in your heart, if it is helpful, you are welcome to take that tear-off sheet that's in your bulletin. Write it down. If it would be helpful to confess it to somebody, write it down, fold it up so no one else can see it, give it to me, and I'll pray for you about that. And I promise you a couple of things. No one else will ever hear about it, ever. I won't judge you as you're walking down the street and I see you, you might, you don't even need to put your name on it. And I'm not going to follow up with you about it unless you come to me and say, Pastor Ed, can we talk about this? But it might be helpful for you to name it because sometimes uh, the sin in, in, that we hold underneath the surface, surface is like a beach ball that is blown up that we're trying to keep underneath the water and we're spending all this energy trying to keep it from popping up so others will see it and we can't do other things. And, and sometimes when you just let it out and you deal with it and, and it's like, ah, oh, thank you, God. And the, the ball just blows away. And it's not a wrestling anymore by the grace of God. So if it's helpful, I invite you to do that. If it's not, no judgment, it's all right. Anyway, my hope is the psalmist's hope. 
It's not the shallow hope of the athlete that God will reward their efforts with a W, with a win. Rather, it's that by confessing our sins before God, that that will take their power and open, open us up to Jesus' forgiveness. By getting them out, we can give, away, uh, give way for God and get rid of those sins in our hearts to forget them and ask God. Because remember, the psalmist asked this, God, forget the sins of all that stuff that I used to do. Remember that I'm seeking you now so that we can remember God's steadfast love and mercy. We need not be ashamed no matter what we have done. For God made us. God loves us. You are so much more than the worst thing you have ever done. In fact, God longs for you to be in full communion with God. And there is nothing that we have done or not done that can stand in the way of God's love. Christ's salvation, the blood of Jesus, covers all and can heal us all. God has reached out to us, invited us through this psalm this morning. Now we can decide to turn from our sins and walk toward God's invitation. We can decide to return and share the forgiving love that God has first given us. And because of what God has first done and and because of this sermon and, and this time that we have spent together, I'm gonna read the prayer of Psalm 25 again. And I just ask you to listen to it. Maybe this prayer will land differently now that you've thought about it a little. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Let none that wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are clothed with treachery. But make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. God, be mindful of your mercy and of your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, the Lord instructs sinners in the way and leads the humble in what is right and teaches them their way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep the Lord's covenant and testimonies. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are welcome if it would be uh, meaningful to you in the rest of the service to come forward and pray. Uh, I would be glad, we would be glad to pray with you as God's church. Um, We come to our time of prayer remembering Slice, uh, who is with the youth at that conference at Lake Junaleska. Uh, We also want to remember Don Hill, who is recovering uh, from a successful surgery. He's recovering at home. He has prostate cancer and Uh, covets your prayers and uh, good wishes. We also thank God uh, that Jeff Fitzgerald is recovering from back surgery that he had, so praise be to God for that. Are, Are there others that we want to lift up at this time? Oh, yes. Your teacher is very sick, so we pray for your teacher. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Anyone else? Yes. Okay, for your son, Christopher, who found out he's going to Kuwait. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yes. For our local school board, for teachers and students uh, and families, for all in our school system, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. There are others. A prayer request was lifted up for a single mother in some crisis who is named Faith. Uh, That was lifted up at the first service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. 
Oh God, uh, it's into your hands that we commend all for whom we pray. There are so many more prayers that, that burden our hearts and minds, that make us anxious and worried, uh, that trouble us. There are people who we care about, who are struggling, and God, so far we haven't been able to figure out a way how to help them. There are so many places in the world, God, rocked by violence and fear. Um, God, we pray that your peace would break out upon the earth. God, for every community in which there is corruption uh, and treachery, God, we pray that your truth would reign and that you would transform those places into places of justice and goodness. God, we pray for all of those, even in our own town, who do not have enough to eat, enough shelter, enough warm clothes. God, we pray that your church would continue to be uh, agents of mercy, but also that we would work for the common good. God, uh, hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we have the privilege uh, of sharing what God has first given to us, a portion of that. Would the ushers please come forward as we receive of our tithes and offerings. God, we thank you for all the gifts that you have first given to us, and we offer back to you a portion of that which you have given. Use these gifts to, to strengthen your church, to bless those who are in need of your love, to transform us in the giving. God, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We remain standing as you're able as we sing our closing hymn number 269, Lord, who throughout these 40 days...
just verse 4 in the hymn we just sang. And through these days of penitence and through thy passion time, yea, evermore in life and death, Jesus with us abide. May, May God, the peace of whom passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus this day and forevermore. May you go from this place in a spirit of forgiveness. Amen.